it's not it's not as encouraging a picture, let's put it that way, as it was when I started. So I think mean, it's inevitable that we're going to lose some. Um, you know, the Fish and Wildlife Service is trying to figure out how it can do a better job with the limited resources that it has, uh, which means they can't do it all uh, unless they get a lot more in the way of resources. So. At the same time, I think a lot of the seeds of a more sustainable future lie in biological processes uh, using biological catalysts instead of toxic chemical ones, and a whole bunch of things like that. Uh, so I think in the end, we have to try and figure out how to greater appreciate uh, the extraordinary diversity with which this this planet and this species has been blessed and try and limit the damages and uh, basically design ourselves a more sustainable future. We're not going in order necessarily. <laughs> um, so you were asking me, uh, at the end of your question about um, you know, the role of diversity in this and given that we're losing diversity, we, we, we might be you know, done because it's gone and we can't get it back quickly and uh, whether or not evolution could recover that quickly. And uh, I had a couple thoughts on one is that, yeah, I mean, obviously if you use, lose species, then you're not going to get them back particularly quickly. Uh, but the other thing is that, you know, there's a lot, there's not a very tight association between biodiversity and something like ecosystem services. So in principle, you could lose, I mean, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but you, you, just because you lose a few species doesn't mean that you're going to lose complete uh, services for the ecosystem. The other thing that, that I've, in a, once again, not justifying the, the value or the okayness of losing species, um, we've been doing a bunch of analyses recently, uh, meta-analyses, looking at the variation in ecosystem function of organisms within and between species. And one thing that we found that's super interesting is that variation within species can have as large an effect on ecosystem function and uh, David's work and Ron Bowser's work in Guppies is uh, an example where you have a huge effect of two different ecotypes in totally altering the, the ecosystem properties. That seems to be a general phenomenon. So there's some encouragement to be taken from the fact that you have a lot of variation within the species in the services that they can provide. And so biodiversity isn't just about species loss, it's about uh, variation within species. And so even if we can't uh, recover species we do have, one thing we can do is we can go out of our way to preserve diversity within species as well as species. And so the perspectives we normally get are about species loss, but population loss is just as critical. And so if we, if we bear that in mind when thinking about biodiversity and biodiversity conservation, then we can perhaps uh, save some of those services that we would otherwise think we might lose uh, permanently with the loss of a particular species. Intraspecific diversity can be just as important. Yeah. Intraspecific diversity is the foundation of evolution. A lot of you have seen the movie Jurassic Park in which Jeff Goldblum's character says, life finds a way. And that is a great frontier right now in conservation. How much can life find a way? How much can biodiversity adapt to the new regimes that we're imposing on this planet. It's an open question, but a new field in conservation right now, which is probably less than 20 years old, is the evolutionary side of conservation. How much can a biosphere adapt? And I want to point out that there's a journal, in case you're interested in looking into this, a fairly new journal called Evolutionary Applications which deals with a broad spectrum of evolutionary applications to practical problems, but a lot of it is conservation. And we have an editor of the journal with us here today. Right, Andrew? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Submit your papers. I promise to reject them. <laughs> Submit them soon. I promise to reject them. <laughs> yeah, I guess the only thing I would add is, you know, one of the things that dominated my career is to um, 
the, the realization that evolution can happen as quickly as it does, and I'm often asked if, the res if evolution is in any way going to resolve the problem. If organisms are capable of evolving out of the difficulties that they face. And in that regard, I can't, I can't offer a whole lot of promise. I mean, it is probably the case that evolution is playing a role in all of the changes that we're seeing going on in terms of species distributions and climate change, and that some species probably will survive whatever catastrophe faces us. And you can say that based on history, that, that we've had major catastrophes that killed 90% of the known metazoans and marine environments, and some of them persisted for a period of time. I don't think there's necessarily that much encouragement to be found in this, because the more dominant theme that we see in the history of life, and the thing that really has shaped the history of life in profound ways is extinction, it's not evolution. All the discontinuity that we see in nature and in biodiversity is, is really the product of the pairing effect of extinction. So, Evolution is, is sort of interesting. Some organisms will have the capacity to adapt to the change that we see. Um, it probably also explains a lot of the interactions that we see, but I don't think it offers that much in the way of promise that organisms are going to be able to deal with change as rapidly as it's happening and, and that things will be okay. Um, you know, that's, that's the sort of thing that I, that I think about as a consequence of, of my work. All right, any other comments on that question? Okay, any other questions? Yeah, the, the, you know, people have been struggling recently to try and relate biodiversity to the provision of ecosystem services and to try and establish those linkages between the importance of biodiversity and maintaining ecosystem services because it's a very tenuous, in some cases, tenuous linkage. And we've seen more and more uh, work being done trying to use functional diversity as a surrogate for species biodiversity or richness or some other measure of biodiversity and relate that to ecosystem services. And those, those functional diversity measures are usually based on you know, morphological aspects of species uh, that can somehow represent a service provider. It's kind of interesting then in terms of intraspecific variability of species uh, would seem to me not to be included as a component of functional diversity. I'm kind of interested in some comments on how you think that it may be more effectively integrated into this whole uh, this whole field of using functional diversity as a, as a, as a surrogate for uh, uh, measuring ecosystem service value. This is a question to me. Uh, anyway. <laughs> um, I, I, I couldn't hear all that you said. Um, can you give me a quick summary again of what the main point was? My hearing is bad. Okay, I, I, I basically was saying that people have used functional diversity as a surrogate for, uh, you know, biodiversity in terms of making estimating the value of biodiversity, the provision of provisioning of ecosystem services. But frequently, those functional diversity measures are based on morphological aspects of, of species. But instead of using actual species, using sort of functional attributes and their contributions to services. And then some of the comments that were just made in terms of the value of intraspecific variability uh, in terms of the ability to provision services across varied landscapes would seem not to align with the way in which we currently measure functional diversity uh, and its value to uh, provisioning services. Yeah, I, I think the key for the example for the point that Andrew Henry was making is that the intraspecific variation is there and is of great value and it, it, it is a measure of the potential of any one species to adapt to a changing environment. And part of that diversity is also the pattern of gene flow among populations and, and the, the ability of individuals to migrate from place to place and interbreed with one another. I, I sort of, you know, when you talk about extinction, I don't think of species. I really think of, of an individual species as being like the lights on a Christmas tree constantly going on and off. And, and the, the consequence of the change, like the, the map that Tom Lovejoy showed us of forest coverage in Wisconsin, is that the, even though among all the different fragments the diversity may be there, it's destined to, to be lost because each individual fragment is a smaller and smaller population of, smaller and smaller population of any species and its interconnections with other species are being broken. Um, and so the, what, it, what it means is that the diversity that's present within species is losing its potential. Um, their, the ability of any one species to evolve and adapt to a changing environment is going to be progressively more limited. And, and so it says that if you're interested in conservation issues and retaining diversity and retaining the, 
capacity of organisms to adapt to change in the environment that you have to think about the connectedness among populations. Um, you can't think about saving a species, you have to think about saving the diversity within a species, which means thinking about its range and range of environments that it encounters and the ability of different populations to exchange individuals with one another. You know, so in that regard, it becomes harder and harder to become optimistic when you look at how landscapes are, are becoming fragmented. Uh, and I wanted to uh, say, I'd like to say something along those lines as well, because uh, I was interested by your, your specific uh, comment that functional diversity is often used as a, as a, as a proxy or a surrogate for species diversity. And, and in reality, I, I think it is the functional diversity that matters. And so really, we use species diversity as a proxy for functional diversity rather than the other way around. And if instead we could reliably quantify the functions of different organisms and use them as predictors of ecosystem services, we'd probably be doing a lot better off. So when we can do that, I think that's extremely valuable, both intra and interspecifically. The difficult thing, of course, is that organisms have many functions that we don't even really realize. And so perhaps still, if we want to have our best uh, perspective on, on what functions organisms are going to perform and how important those organisms are, then really we, we're stuck at the species or the, or the evolutionary distance metric, phylogenetic diversity, because those are capturing a bunch of things that we wouldn't even otherwise think to measure. So there's, there's one aspect that uh, usually gets left out, uh, which is what I sometimes call knowledge services, uh, which is, you know, the diversity in life on Earth is actually represents this incredible library uh, from which the life sciences can be built. Uh, and we have absolutely no way that that's ever taken into account or value. Uh, but, you know, take something like the polymerase chain reaction. It only functions because of an enzyme from a Yellowstone hot spring bacteria. Uh, when it was conceived of, it wasn't actually even a possible chain reaction because nobody knew of a heat-resistant enzyme that, uh, that could actually make it work. Uh, and Pavan Supdev, when I told him about what PCR is actually made possible, including the Human Genome Project, and he said it had to be at least you know, a trillion dollars worth of benefit that came from that. So that's one of the things we need to to do a much better job of figuring out how to add to the, the reasons for protecting as much as we can. Mike, Thank you all for coming. Uh, I really enjoyed all the talks today. And one thing I would keep thinking about, and a couple of you have touched on a little bit, is the ability of species to adapt and develop under different conditions. Uh, a couple of your talks highlighted some instances where species do have abilities to evolve rapidly into different conditions of various sorts. I think in conservation we're often focusing, and even evolutionary research, we're often focusing on species that are of some conservation concern and may already have smaller populations. Do you think that, we, that there might be a lot of rapid evolution going on in nature that we're just not observing because we're not focusing on the right species? Or do you think that uh, there's just not enough uh, variability within populations to rapidly evolve at a fast time scale? Um, I think there's uh, I think there's a lot of rapid evolution going on all the time. I mean, the interesting thing is that if you don't know how to look for it, you're not going to see it. And every time people have taken the uh, the opportunity to figure out how do you systematically track what's going on in populations and environments, you tend to find it. So for example, in the Galapagos finches, what was going on in those populations had been going on under people's noses for the longest time, but it wasn't until you started looking at individuals and marked populations of individuals over time that you would realize that in fact there was remarkably rapid evolution, but it was evolution that was tracking an environment and it was an environment that was varying in, a, in an erratic fashion, so it wasn't necessarily going in a given direction. There's another example like that of looking at flowering time in brassica, they have a weed in, in California that was tracking the rainy season and how much rain you had in the spring and how long it had to grow 
and, and flower, and it always was advantageous to grow longer and be bigger and, and produce more seeds, but if you had light rain, those individuals weren't going to survive. And if you watch them from year to year, you would think nothing was going on, but if you collected the seeds every year and preserved them and then looked at them 10 years later, 10 years of seeds over time, you can see that in fact those populations really were evolving considerably on a year-to-year -year basis. And so yeah, evolution is happening, I think, quickly and, and you probably can find it in many places if you take the time to look for it. Um, how that relates to biodiversity, I mean, part of it is, is the, you know, again, back to the issue that Andrew made, that interspecific variation is important and each species that's widely distributed at least will, will have a lot that could be important over time. And, Conservation, you know, the way conservation is done, they usually don't have the resources or, or the, the ability to preserve interspecific diversity in the way that you would want. Um, you know, and for some organisms, the capacity to evolve probably will rescue them. I mean, we know historically that some organisms do have the capacity to sustain themselves in the face of remarkable environmental change, and, and it probably has something to do with an inherent property that they have. Um, but it, it's hard for me to reconcile evolution with conservation and, and think that, like I said, that it's going to save us. That the capacity to, to adapt to a changing world is, is going to do much for most organisms. Most of them are not going to be able to change quickly enough and most of them are going to disappear. And the reason I say that is because you can look back in history and see that that's what's happened. And you can assess how quickly things are changing now. And they're changing very fast in comparison to how the world has tended to change in the past. <clears throat> Some things evolve faster than others. Uh, so many of you uh, know of an organism called the coelacanth, <laughs> the lobe-finned fish. Okay? As a conservation priority, if I want to preserve the deep branches in the tree of life, that would be a huge priority. But as an evolutionary biologist, I would have to say that thing had its day. And I would concentrate more on cichlids than coelacans. As many of you know, the African Rift Lake cichlids have produced hundreds of new species in the last couple of thousand years. So if you're going to look at the evolutionary aspect of conservation, one of the uh, surrogates for really understanding what's going on is recent track record. What species and what groups have shown success very recently? I love that. Seedle cats have had their day. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to use that. Yeah. I, I, I think, like David does, that evolution is occurring everywhere all the time. As a matter of fact, everything has to be evolving just to be able to persist in their environment. So even if populations are relatively static, they're still evolving like crazy, which seems paradoxical, but really it's, you know, you have to run to keep in place. Um, uh, however, one thing that's interesting is that almost all of the studies demonstrating this are looking at the evolution of traits. And so the traits might be evolving like crazy in an adaptive fashion, and it's perhaps important for the organism, but the question is how does that, how does that trait change translate to fitness improvement in the new environment? And I also, I, I rarely agree with David, but I find myself agreeing with him a lot today because um, that's, that's uh, it's probably true that most organisms will not be able to evolve fast enough when it comes to their fitness to be able to respond to uh, the rapid rate of climate change we have now. Yet, what really matters is the variation within species bringing us back to that, the importance of that perspective on thinking about variation within species, the function it has, the potential that it gives organisms for being able to respond to environmental change. So, uh I'd like to say something for the seal camp, <laughs> and, and I mean, it's not the seal camp per se, but uh, the wonder of life on Earth is one of the the, the great things we we have to to help us uh, end up with better outcomes, and uh, you know the whole issue. Of, whether people get outdoors enough uh, to appreciate any of that is a, is a huge issue. But my, my version of, of this aspect of wonder is if you ask any journalist, is discovering a new species newsworthy, they will tell you no. <laughs> 
And yet, look how journalists actually treat it when it happens. It's considered interesting. Uh, so, part of our grand plan should be, you know, saving some of those sources of, of inspiration. Take 
what we're doing in basic science and revise management policy in light of, of the sort of models that, that we, we deal with. I think there's some effort to do that. For some of them, I, I think it's too late, but um, I, I think there is a potential for a very specific transfer of knowledge from evolutionary biology, biology into, into wildlife management and fisheries management. So I'd like just to add to that, uh, that <clears throat> almost anywhere one looks at a production system, uh, the general way that it's approached is to get the maximum yield out of it, uh, assuming that nothing else is going to come along and upset the production curve. Uh, and that's what always happens. So we need to sort of manage our own psychology in these systems. Yeah, actually, uh, there's a really cool example where um, what happens in crops, of course, is that you often, although not always, tend to focus in on the most productive plum, including clones that kind of get along with each other. So they can have higher total productivity and clones that are willing to give up vegetative growth for the production of their seeds, which might be harvested in the perspective of cereals. So rice uh, is one of these examples where huge regions of China and other places, India, can be planted with one strain of rice. These strains, of, single strains of rice, are very sensitive to emerging pathogens, such as rusts that infect rice. And uh, they did a huge experiment across a massive area of China, of course it was you know, told to do it by the government, where they planted some areas in monocultures of this one productive strain and other areas in uh, polycultures of multiple different clones of rice. And the areas that were in these polycultures, including clones that would not normally be the most productive, actually had a much better resistance to these uh, emerging pathogens and as a result ended up having higher total productivity. So it was a specific example where taking into consideration um, evolutionary diversity and maintaining that diversity had a direct positive benefit on society. I would say um, <clears throat> the best way to make the research presented in the first three talks relevant to the fourth talk is a point that Tom touched on at the end, which is public education. Mm -hmm. All right, next question, please. We have Mr. Um, John Peretz. Uh, it's a little nebulous, so, so bear with me, but I, I was thinking a lot about sort of the interplay of ecological speciation and the sort of the extremism of environments implemented by climate change, and sort of what Andrew was touching on, like those sort of uh, time points in the speciation process, like where adaptive uh, response to a, a, a different environment switches over into reproductive isolation. And I'm wondering if, because we have neutral loci that sort of lag behind in the evolutionary time scale and our ability to detect that reproductive isolation, what might be the interplay of like, having more extreme environments because of climate change and the potential of us missing environmental segregation of populations that otherwise look connected from a management perspective and, and how we might have to, to deal with that in the future, if that makes any sense. Well, so I guess I'll, I'll start um, uh, and say that there, there's a whole bunch of really interesting examples where you essentially have the formation or onset of new species as a result of uh, environmental change is often induced by humans. Uh, the, the most dramatic example is where you have new host plants that are introduced into a particular area and then you have native uh, phytophagous insects colonizing them and then evolving a new host race. And there are many other examples. David has a cool one in his, uh, his book about um, mosquitoes in the, in the tunnels of uh, the London underground that have basically evolved re reproductive isolation from their ancestors. So. Um, I think that there are a, a large number of examples of humans having both positive and negative effects on the origins of reproductive isolation and therefore new species. And I think there are many, many more out there because, as you point out, environmental change is, in an ecological perspective, the driver of new species. So humans can indeed actually be accelerating the recovery, if you will, of biodiversity. But certainly the very long branches like coelacanths, if you lose that, you're, 
not going to get it back. And for all we know, acetyl cancer driving the, uh, that current that you think is so important down there. You know, they go on the bottom and they, 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 they that's what's the gula current and they the acetyl cancer doing that. Well, they better get busy. <laughs> So some, uh, there are some ideas about how uh, intraspecific polymorphism is maintained. Uh, so one potential mechanism is to have a fluctuating environment where uh, the polymorphism itself can persist in, in a single species. So um, a lot of the global change um, presentations I've seen will give you an average of the prediction, but um, I rarely see predictions about what the fluctuation will be, which might actually um, affect how intraspecific variation will be, uh, will be retained. So uh, is there any data on how the fluctuation will be projected in the future and what would, the, what would be the potential um, effect on some of these polymorphisms? So you're talking about within population variation and the extent right. to which it's going to be the extending, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I mean, when they talk about global change, they've talked about increased variance in, in weather uh, within a given area, and how that would relate to maintaining polymorphism, I could not begin to predict. I mean, in, in general, you know, that is one way of maintaining polymorphisms in natural populations, but there are lots of other ways of doing it as well. I, 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 w I couldn't even give an educated guess on what the consequences would be. <laughs> okay, um, first of all, there's an iron law of population genetics that genetic diversity is a function of effective population size, which is why there's such a concern that reduced populations cannot respond to future environmental challenges. Secondly, there's an interesting review paper that came out recently on how fisheries have reduced genetic diversity. Um, it's Pinsky and someone, I can't remember. Um, Dr. Puritz, do you remember where that's published? Uh, I don't remember. It's, it's Pinsky and Columbia, isn't it? Oh, that's it. Um, Pinsky and Columbia. Um, you can Google search it and find it. It shows a, a really um, interesting summary of the data available on how harvesting has reduced genetic diversity in wild populations. So that, that would predict if more dramatic fluctuations caused more dramatic variation in population size over time, that you tend to lose genetic diversity. Um, so in addition to, to those effects, uh, you, you might also be interested in particular uh, phenotypic polymorphisms that, you know, like uh, large and small beak Darwin's finches, for example. Um, I think that in those cases, a lot of those polymorphisms are maintained by some sort of frequency-dependent process, right? So when something gets rare, then all of a sudden it's, it, it becomes favored. So rock, scissors, papers, or you know, any kind of uh, game like that. It's not clear to me how those would or would not change with, with environmental change or climate change. The question would be if, in that context, in addition to the effects that these guys are talking about, would frequency dependence be fundamentally altered? Uh, I'm not sure. Or it could be that if population sizes get smaller, that you're more likely to lose the rare types by stochastic processes. Or if there's an interaction between density and frequency dependence, such that at low densities, frequency dependence becomes weaker. Maybe in those cases, but I, I can't think of a, a, a general rule whereby we would expect the increase or decrease in the amount of these uh, manifest polymorphisms in addition to overall genetic variation. I, I think the general rule would still would be that if the population sizes are fluctuating more in time and, and you have frequency dependence, that something that's rare is more likely to be lost in entirety. You know, I think that it's inexorable that, that an increased variance is gonna is gonna diminish genetic variation.
Uh, I'm going to be devil's advocate a little bit. I'm going to challenge the, uh, the key to the future being public education a little bit. I had a roommate one time who was getting a PhD in nuclear engineering. His uh, sister was a PhD in biology and ecologist. I had conversations like this with him all the time, and he was convinced that we would be able to engineer our way out of any problems that uh, we're going to have in the future with climate change, things like that. And he's a well-educated individual, and I just wonder I think that just says that you should get them when they're young. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. Um, uh, I was at a meeting recently, a scientific meeting, where the head of an NGO, a conservation organization, got up there and said, you scientists have to be more proactive about getting your message across to the public. It's a theme you hear a lot. And the response from the scientific audience was, ah, great, now we've got to do their job as well as our job. Okay? So there's an element of that, that the scientists, if you envision conservation as a war or a struggle, the scientists in our center, the support personnel, they're not flying the plane, but they're making sure that the plane has all the parts, okay? Providing the information that conservationists can use to make their case and to make prudent decisions. So in a sense, I agree with you that scientists maybe shouldn't be the public educators at the forefront. But on the other hand, you got to see there's many examples of senior scientists who use their clout to get the message across. And that invokes another question about how strong should people early in their career be advocating positions in conservation. I've seen an editorial in a scientific magazine, I'm sorry, the journal Conservation Biology, that says we need more research to show how bad grazing is on on the mid-American plains. Well, we know how that research is going to turn out, right? So advocacy is a, is a tricky thing, especially for people young in their career. But I think senior scientists can be very effective at this. <laughs> so uh, the two things I want to say. So I teach course called Challenges in Biodiversity. And it's all about, instead of learning a topic or a field, it's about solving problems. And uh, one of the exercises I gave them uh, this semester uh, was a paper, which in the end was a flawed paper, but that was irrelevant. Uh, it, it was seriously questioning uh, one of the underlying things that we all use, the species area curves. Uh, and my challenge to the class was, suppose you got this result, how would you write this paper knowing that people other than scientists are going to be reading this paper? Uh, and it was a really useful discussion. Uh, so. The other, the other thought that's always been in my head is, so when I was in graduate school, uh, my father-in-law uh, was one of the art historians who got involved in rescuing uh, the, uh, it was called the Committee for Rescuing Italian Art after the Arno River overflowed in Florence. Uh, and I was, I was just really impressed by how many people whose who's basically, so their scholarship was based on all this art, uh, felt a responsibility to do something. Uh, and then, you know, I looked around me and a lot of my colleagues, you know, I didn't have that same sort of sense about their own objects of scholarship. So, I think that's actually been changing. Uh, you know, when the Society for Conservation Biology was started, uh, for a while it was the fastest growing society around, and half of them, half of the new members were graduate students. Uh, but, you know, not everybody's going to be comfortable doing that. Uh, I never found it 
difficult, you know, to think like a scientist when I'm doing a piece of science and to think like a citizen, you know, when I'm talking about the policy implications. As Steve Schneider once said, he didn't check his citizenship at the door. So, I mean, there's another way if you're talking about the uh, public education and what could be done that actually anyone here could do more effectively. And it's from, you know, sort of it was influenced by NSF's policy initiated a few years ago that they called broader impacts. And it was the sort of thing that I originally reacted to by thinking, oh, this is just another hurdle they're putting in our way that, that we have to do that was a pain. And, and over time, it was a power of suggestion that, in fact, there were things that you can add to your, your research program that are relatively easy and that can extend the impact and, and actually can be kind of fun, which is to make appearances in public schools. I've, I've got done it all the way down from first grade up to high school level of making presentations about science and talking about um, the sorts of issues of conservation that we're talking about here, but really doing it more in the realm of basic science and the kind of work that we do to get people informed about what science is and what scientific inquiry is all about and prepare them not to become scientists when they, when they leave school. When you're talking to junior high kids, very few of them are going to become scientists, but to sort of train them in citizenship. There, anybody who leaves any level of education is at some point in their life going to encounter the products of science. They're going to hear about climate warming, the clim climate change, or, or the warming of the climate, or other things, or fisheries. They're in the newspaper, and they're deep down behind them is some aspect of science. And if they've been armed to at least understand what science is and how those facts are arrived at, they'll be better able to judge for themselves. So that's something that we all can do. I mean, you do have to be a senior citizen or senior scientist if you're going to advocate at the level of, of changing policy. But any graduate student on up can have a very important impact by just having outreach activities in, at the public school level. So that, that's really important. One other thing that I've sort of fallen into uh, is, is taking these mythical beasts called decision makers. Um, they to, exist? I've never met one. No, they do. <laughs> uh, sometimes nobody pays any attention to the decision, but that's another matter. But, so taking them to spend two or three nights in my, my camp in the Amazon. And my approach has changed over the years from you know, doing a, a lot of lecturing in the process of doing that to mostly letting the forest and the graduate students uh, do the communicating. Uh, and it's extraordinarily effective. And there's pre-selection involved of being willing to go you know, spend a night in a hammock. You know. uh, but, you know, there have only been a couple people who didn't really get it afterwards, and uh, one of those was a senator whose name I'll tell you not in front of a microphone, but uh, even he would answer a telephone call for me afterwards, so I got that out of it and did something for conservation in Puerto Rico. I was just uh, also thinking, you know, uh, about engaging in public education and, you know, what students are really good at, of course, is blogging and tweeting and funny YouTube videos and things like that. And, and those are things that the public actually reads. So you're going to do a dance, your PhD thing, right? About environmental estrogens influencing seahorses. And so she's looking for a guy to do the dance with her. The dance, your PhD. Yeah, right. So you have to be a pregnant male, basically. <laughs> but, but that's the kind of thing. If that's a funny video, right, that, that can reach a lot of people. And there's some great ones like that. Uh, I was trying to think, well, there's that, there's that uh, evolution rapper guy, Baba Brinkman. Yeah, he he's reaches thousands of people. Uh, and it's just a way of being funny, but also educating at the same time. And there are these, uh, I'm trying to think of these YouTube videos where it's like some voiceover that sounds like Morgan Freeman, where he's talking about, you know, different animals. Uh, uh, true facts about the platypus. True facts about, the, they're just hilarious. And they have lots and lots of views. So that's, that's another way, is just, you know, have a presence online and because any random person could see that and that's not likely to be scientists, whereas if all we do is write scientific papers and 
talk to people in places like this, well, you know, we're preaching to the converted to a large extent, but, you know, in the, in the great uh, democracy that is the internet, you know, you can get your stuff out there as long as, long as you're somehow funny or engaging or and naked so, or whatever. <laughs> so a sense of humor is really important, and if you haven't seen it, there's a great link floating around uh, of David Attenborough doing a voiceover of women's curling at the Olympics. It's really funny. <laughs> We have time for one or two more questions. <coughs> it's more, I guess, of a comment than a, than a question. You know, but after Rio 92, when the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was created, it didn't really begin to have teeth until they appointed a scientific advisory board, which is the IPCC, which eventually attracted some world-class climatologists uh, who began to gather the data that began to make the convincing argument that we were, we were dealing with serious problems associated with climate change to the point that they won a Nobel Prize. And, and somebody earlier had mentioned on the panel the creation of IPIS, which is the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is basically a, a sister institution, a peer institution of IPCC. And I think it is a tremendous opportunity in terms of, of getting science in the public eye for people who work on biodiversity, for people who work in ecosystem services or EVO services, to begin to get that kind of evolutionary thought and the importance of those considerations and to understanding the importance of biodiversity and providing critical services. I think it's, there's the potential for this to be an incredibly important uh, UN-sponsored science organization. And I'd really love to see more and more people become involved with it. Decisions get made without including 
the actual measurable value uh, that biodiversity ecosystems are actually contributing. Uh, and there's a really important exercise about all of this, which you can Google if you don't already know about it. It's called the TEEB, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. Uh, and it's got some really classic examples in it of you know, whether you would uh, whether it makes sense to to tear down mangroves to set up shrimp aquaculture, uh, and you know you, you look at the first set of numbers. Well, of course you do that, and then you take the subsidies out. And well, maybe you wouldn't. Then you, in addition, uh, put some sort of value on the contribution to fishery productivity, uh, and you'd never do it. Uh, so. There are a whole bunch of people in the conservation world who get offended by this idea. They call it putting price on nature. Um, I don't think it's putting a price on nature. It's recognizing some of its value. And the sum is the really important uh, point here because uh, uh, there's a lot of value that's yet to be discovered. Uh, and just because <clears throat> something turns out to be, you know, like a truffle, right? Uh, doesn't mean that some other fungus isn't going to ultimately produce a really important uh, antibiotic or whatever it may be. So, just balancing it uh, is important, but I think including it is important. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a really famous story uh, which goes back ultimately to a biology teacher who taught a, essentially a biodiversity class, which uh, started me in my life. Um, and so it's, when I'm growing up in New York City <clears throat> and I'd come home from college <clears throat> and I'd have a glass of water, I'd go, whoa, that tastes so good. <laughs> uh, and New York City water was famous. It would, it would win in blind tastings against avian water stuff like that. <clears throat> well, the watershed deteriorated over time because of land use changes. <clears throat> and EPA was about to require the city to spend $8 billion to build a water treatment plant. Uh, when somebody suggested uh, that it actually would be a cheaper and permanent solution if you just restored the watershed. Uh, and that's ultimately what was done at 10% of the cost of building a water treatment plant. Uh, now, what does that have to do with biodiversity other than it's an ecosystem service? Uh, <clears throat> it's that the head of Region 2 of EPA who pressed the administrator in Washington to accept this solution. You know, had learned about biodiversity at the same age I had, just, he was just a little bit older. And he, such a modest guy, he was a friend of mine, I never knew about it until I read his obituary. Well, all right. Thank you so much for um, those great questions. We are going to hold the rest of the questions for um, tonight's reception at Dr. Lee Fitzgerald.